welcome uh, everybody. Welcome everybody here and welcome everybody in the room adjoining this one. Uh, very honored to announce to you uh, a talk by um, uh, Barry Schwartz, who is going to talk about his book, The Paradox of uh, Choice. Uh, Barry Schwartz is, is the Doris Cartwright Professor of Social Theory and Social Action at Swarthmore, Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, United States. Um, he's going to give us his talk. After that, we're going to have a discussion. Uh, this, in this discussion, we'll be uh, joined by Daniel Wichbolders, who is a professor of social uh, psychology and the dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences here at Radboud University. And there will be lots of uh, possibilities for you, actually, also to ask uh, questions. One final thing. Um, after the talk, um, Barry Schwartz will speed up to the next room, uh, where he will answer a few questions there. So people in the other room who are watching this uh, uh, by close uh, circuit television, stay in your room until uh, Barry Schwartz comes. Um, we would have liked him to sign, to actually for you to be able to buy his book and to sign it, but the books haven't arrived. Um, that's, this, that's the bad news. The good news is that you can sign up. There will be a list um, back there. You can enter your name and the book will somehow, with signature, uh, be sent to you. So if you leave your name and address on the list, you will have the book with the signature by Barry Schwartz. It will not be personalized, I'm afraid. That's the only uh, drawback we have. So, Barry, can you... That's an amazing welcome. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> I'm afraid that all I can do at this point is disappoint you, which is part of what I'm going to try to convince you all this choice does to us. I'm really honored to be here. I'm particularly honored to be talking. I gather there are a bunch of high school students. I, <laughs> I have to say I have never talked about this topic to high school students, so I'm going to give you the following prediction. You're going to disagree with everything I say, <laughs> and you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're not going to know that until it's too late. <laughs> All right, let's see if this actually works. Whoop, yeah. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, there is, in most uh, industrial Western societies, a set of assumptions about what's worthwhile and what's a good way to organize uh, uh, social life that I have come to call the official syllogism. And it runs roughly like this. The more uh, freedom people have, the better off they are. Freedom is good. Yes, anyone disagree that freedom is good? Well, if freedom is good, more freedom is better, right? Of course, we all think that. How could that not be true? The more freedom people have, the better off they are. Fine. OK. If you accept it, the question then is, what does it mean to have freedom? And the answer is, you don't have freedom unless you have choice. So it must be that the more choice people have, the more freedom they have. Freedom without choice is empty. Uh, if you're going to cash in your commitment to giving people freedom, you have to give them choice. More freedom means more well-being, and more choice means more freedom. If you accept these two principles, as we pretty much all do, what follows? The more choice people have, the better off they are. How could this not be true? We have certainly acted as if it's true. Um, I know that you live in a small country. And that probably means that you have smaller stores. I assume everything is scaled down. You have smaller people, smaller, no. <laughs> well, anyway, I went to my local supermarket and I just counted. I didn't buy anything. I thought they would arrest me. I just counted. And this is what I counted. There were 285 different kinds of cookies, 75 iced teas, 40 different kinds of toothpaste. There were also 40 different kinds of dental floss, in case you're, you want just the right 
um, minty flavor and width to fit your teeth. Uh, 230 kinds of soup, 175 different kinds of salad dressing, 275 different kinds of cereal. We all agree this is a lot of choice. And this was not an especially big supermarket. Now, there's nothing dramatically new about having choice in supermarkets. We have always had choice in markets. We just have more of it. And some people would argue that this is a mere quantitative change from some choice to a lot of choice. I'm inclined to think that when you're choosing among 275 cereals, it may be quantitative, but it isn't mere. It's a fairly significant challenge to choose among 275 kinds of cereal, but we've always, we're used to having to make choices in supermarkets. There are other parts of life where there used to be no choice, and now I know none of you people in the back are going to believe this. Take phone service. There was a time when there was one phone company, and it made one phone. And not only that, you couldn't even buy it. You had to rent it. So you had no choice. The only choice you had when it came to phones was whether or not to use it, especially if somebody called who you didn't especially want to talk to. So here is a domain where people had no choice, and now there is an extraordinary amount of choice. What instrument, what, comp what provider, what plan, uh, the list is endless. These are the phones of the future. My favorite is the middle one, a phone, an MP3 player, a nose hair trimmer, and a creme brulee torch. <laughs> now, here's what's funny about this cartoon. I hope you think there's something funny about this cartoon. This cartoon is a decade old, before the iPhone, so this looked preposterous. Now, you look at this and you go, that's all it does? So times have changed. And people now spend a significant amount of time and energy and cognitive resources deciding what phone, what provider, what plan. You have been liberated from having to use the one and only kind of phone that was available. And this leads people occasionally to go into their cell phone store and ask this question, do you have a phone that doesn't do too much? As near as I can tell, the answer to that question is no. There's only one kind of phone you can't buy, and that's a phone that is only a phone. They don't exist anymore. So here's an, a manifestation of the extraordinary increase in freedom that we've had. Here's another example. You know, you used to go to work. You'd show up at 9. You'd come home at 5. Sorry, 5. What's that, 1,700? Huh? Yes? I get that right? 12, 12 years. Yeah. You'd work. And when you were in the office, you worked. And when you were out of the office, you didn't work. And that was that. Well, those days are gone. Now, we get to decide every minute of every day whether or not to work, no matter where we are. I just want to go home, crawl into bed, and do some more work. This is also liberating. Isn't it great to be able to work from home in your pajamas? Yes, it's great. On the other hand, you are now faced with choices all the time about whether to work. I have watched my daughter and son-in-law take their eight-year-old to soccer. Now, as near as I can tell, there is no activity on earth more boring than watching eight-year-olds play soccer. And there they are with their laptop in their lap and their cell phone on their hip. And they don't turn on the laptop and they don't turn on the cell phone. But they spend the soccer game asking themselves every minute, should I return that call? Should I reply to that text? Should I draft the memo? And whether, even if you answer no to all of those questions, it dramatically changes the character of watching your kid play soccer. Liberating, yes. Marital and family arrangements, and I know you're not going to like this. So, so there was a time in the distant, distant, distant past when nobody asked the question, should I get married? Because there was a default answer to that question. Everyone, the default answer was yes. No one asked the question, uh, when? Because it was a default answer to that question. 
as soon as possible. No one asked the question, should I have children, because there was a default answer. No one asked the question, when, because the answer was, as soon as possible. Not everyone followed this pattern, but almost everyone did, and the people who didn't, everybody gossiped about. Nowadays, none of those are defaults. Uh, uh, back in these days, there was only one question that was not a default, and that question was, who? And people screwed up answering that question a lot. So just imagine how badly wrong you can go when you are also asking whether and when. So as near as I can tell, in civilized places like where you live and where I live, there are no defaults. Everything, every imaginable kind of intimate relationship is possible and even encouraged. Is, you're liberated. We don't believe in pressuring the children. When the time is right, they'll choose the appropriate gender. Religion. Um, uh, you know, we are not saddled with the religion of our birth. If we had a religion of birth, we are free to um, choose a different flavor of that religion or choose a wholly different religion. It's a matter of choice whether you're going to be religious, and if so, in what form uh, uh, you're going to be religious. Uh, we're thinking maybe it's time you started getting some religious instruction. There's Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish any of those sound good to you? Now, I know there are parents who have this kind of conversation with their six-year-old children. How do I know it? Because I was one of them. I'm embarrassed to say. You know, I believe in freedom of choice. Why force your kids to do stuff? Let them make their, their own minds. Surely, by the age of six, you're wise enough to make decisions about what kind of religious observance, if any, to follow. So, this pretty much captures everything. Consumer goods, work, um, uh, intimate relationships, religious observances, every aspect of life. There is a level of choice that didn't used to be here before. Uh, and uh, based on the syllogism that I uh, presented you, all of this is very good news. So the world used to look like this. Well, actually, they are written in stone. Not everything, but there were some things that were written in stone. And now the world looks like this. And the question is, is this good news or bad news? And the answer, as I'm sure you know, is yes. We all know what's good about it. I am not going to spend any time talking to you about what's good about it because we know what's good about it. What I'm going to do is focus on the unexpected dark side of having all of this freedom of choice, which nobody anticipated, or almost nobody anticipated. So to anticipate where I'm going to get to eventually when I'm done with all of this around midnight tonight, um, uh, choice is good, but it isn't only good. And it is a recent discovery in psychology laboratories that there are real problems associated with this kind of freedom of choice uh, that, will make, that will end up subverting freedom rather than encouraging it. So too much choice has several different bad effects, and I'm going to focus on two of them. One is paradoxically, instead of liberating people, it paralyzes them. There are so many options, they can't, people just can't pull the trigger. They walk out with nothing in the face of an infinite variety. It's not way, the way it's supposed to work. The first demonstration of this is a study that was done uh, by a colleague of mine and a fancy food store in a, a very wealthy suburb of uh, San Francisco. And, and whenever this place got a new product, they would put it out on display and people could taste it, and if they liked it, they'd buy it. And so they got these fancy jams from England, and one day they set out 30 different flavors of this jam. Can you imagine that there are 30 different flavors of jam? I mean, that's just ludicrous 
on its face. 30 different flavors of jam. You'd stop by, you'd taste as many as you wanted, and if you did, you would get a coupon that would save you a dollar on any jam you bought. A few days later, they set out a table with six different flavors of jam. And again, if you stopped by and tasted the jam, you'd get a coupon that saved you a dollar on any jam you bought. More people came to the table and tasted jam when there were 30 flavors than when there were six. Substantially more people were attracted to the display that had lots of variety. One-tenth as many people bought jam. I'll say that again. One-tenth as many people bought jam. Why? because they couldn't figure out which jam to buy. So they bought none. This was the first demonstration of how choice, when it is excessive, we don't know what excessive means, when it's excessive, instead of liberating people, it makes it impossible for them to choose at all. In the United States, when people um, work, uh, there's no longer a pension, a uh, company pension, the way they are used to be. Instead, now, you put money into a retirement plan, your employer puts money into the retirement plan, and then when you retire, if you have invested wisely, put your money into good mutual funds instead of bad mutual funds, you'll have a nice nest egg to retire on. So we call these things 401k plans. Some employers offer a few options, some offer 10 some offer 30, some offer 100, some offer hundreds of different possible investments. And the question that the researchers asked is, how does the number of available options affect whether people choose to participate? Based on the syllogism I gave you and based what any, on what any economist would tell you, the more uh, options you offer, the more likely people will participate because people will, everybody will be able to find something that they find acceptable in terms of risk, in terms of whether there are any filters associated with things like uh, pollution, po high pollution industry. There's bound to be some mutual fund or funds that you find acceptable when you have 200 to choose from. If there are only two, maybe not. What the researchers found is that the more mutual funds there were, the less likely people were to choose any. Every 10 funds that you made available reduced participation by 2%. This is a mammoth finding of enormous practical significance in a country like the United States where the average savings rate is negative. People do not save money in the United States. Anything that you do to discourage people from saving money is an unmitigated disaster. Nobody thought that's what they were doing when they offered people all these options, but that turned out to be the effect. And understand, that by not signing up, they are passing up significant matching money from their employer. It's as if they were taking a match and lighting it to a check for $5,000, which is what the employer would contribute if you participate. But they found it so hard to decide which fund to choose that they chose none. The same thing has happened now that we have finally gotten almost civilized in the United States and offered prescription drugs to senior citizens uh, at substantial uh, discount. And we did it the American way, which was instead of there being a national plan, we encouraged private providers to come up with plans. And states came up with 50, 75, 90 different drug plans. And here you are, you're 65 years old, and you can register to get a gift from the government. Why on earth would anyone not register? It's free money. Sign up, get your drugs for free. No recreational drugs, by the way. <laughs> but then again, senior citizens don't take recreational drugs. Uh, so, well, most senior citizens don't take, <laughs> don't take most recreational drugs. <laughs> so what happens is you had to bully people into signing up because they couldn't figure out which plan to choose. Any plan, any of the plans offered was better than no plan, but they were so completely befuddled by the task of figuring out which was the right plan that they ended up not choosing at all. Okay, so these are serious examples of how too much choice produces paralysis, not liberation. If you overcome paralysis and choose, 
And let's assume you choose well. There's a second problem, and this is the one that I, my own work has focused on more, and that is even when you choose well, if you choose from a large set of options, you will be less satisfied with what you have chosen than if you choose exactly the same thing from a small set of options. Let me be very clear what I'm saying. You go to a restaurant. There are five items on the menu. One of them is sautéed chicken with rice and uh, Brussels sprouts. You choose it. Five things on the menu. You eat it. It's pretty good. You go to another restaurant. A few days later, there are 30 things on the menu. One of them is grilled chicken, sautéed chicken with, uh, what I say, rice and Brussels sprouts. You choose it. You like it less than you like the one you chose when there were only five things on the menu. The mere fact that there are a lot of options you are saying no to makes you get less satisfaction out of the option that you're saying yes to. Have any of you ever had this experience? No? You know, you order something and it's pretty good, but you spend the whole meal thinking about how one of the options would have been better? This has never happened to you? Come on! You must, you must really go to crappy restaurants. So, whoops, I don't know why that happened. Well, doesn't matter. Okay, why does this happen? There are several reasons. One, regret. You order this chicken, and the chicken is a little tiny bit overcooked. And the Brussels sprouts are just a tad too crunchy for your liking. It's good, it, it's good, but it's not great. So, you're kind of sorry that you chose it because you know that somewhere out there in this list of 30 alternatives, there had to be something better. If there were only two alternatives, you'd be less likely to think that somewhere out there would be something better. So you're more likely to, re to regret an outcome that is less than perfect if the set of alternatives is large than if the set of alternatives is small. And what happens when you do regret what you've chosen is that the regret subtracts from the satisfaction that you get out of whatever it is you've chosen. So let's say you, you know, the chicken is eight on a 10 point scale, but you regret it for its imperfections and that subtracts two, so you end up with a net satisfaction of six on a 10 point scale. That's the process I'm talking about. Now, anticipated regret is worse than actual regret. How, what's the only thing you can do to avoid regretting decisions, aside from having your frontal lobes removed? What's the only thing you can do to avoid regretting decisions? There's only one thing. Don't make them. Exactly. The way to avoid regret is by not choosing. And the reason, a reason, a significant reason why people are paralyzed when there are lots of options, is it's a way to avoid regretting the wrong choice. So this is one way in which large choice sets make people less satisfied with uh, outcomes, even when the outcomes are pretty good. Related, but not identical, is, uh, is what I call missed opportunity. Suppose you're reasonably confident that the chicken, you must all be getting tired of chicken, not to mention Brussels sprout. I could have said kale. Is kale the fashionable thing in this country too? No, it has taken over the United States. Kale is just everywhere. Anyway, I'm waiting for kale brownies. Those have not yet shown up, but eventually they will. So you eat the chicken and the rice and the Brussels sprouts, and you know, you're pretty sure you made the right choice. No mistake, I did not make a mistake. I don't regret having chosen the chicken and the rice and the Brussels sprouts. But here's the thing. The salmon had pasta, and I like pasta better than rice. So by having the chicken, I passed up the pasta. No mistake, but it was a missed opportunity. I could have had pasta. And the pork had uh, green beans instead of Brussels sprouts. I like green beans better than Brussels sprouts. No mistake, I made the right choice, but I passed up an opportunity to have the green beans. Missed opportunities to choose attractive things that are part of other options. Now, you can have this feeling even if you don't think you made the wrong decision. And the more options you are saying no to, the more attractive opportunities you will be passing up. 
And the opportunities, attractive opportunities you pass up, subtract from the satisfaction you get from the opportunity you've chosen, even if you don't think you made a mistake. Here's an example of missed opportunities in action. I don't think this needs explanation. Does it need explanation? It needs explanation to you people in the back. <laughs> not, for the, not for the reason you think. I know you know what sex is. Here's why it needs an explanation. Everybody who's under the age of 25 thinks that you can actually do more than one thing at a time. Well, you can't. You can't. You may pretend that you can do more than one thing at a time, but in fact, when you do more than one thing at a time, all the things you're doing suffer. And that's what this, pardon me? Women can, not at the, they, you, you, do, you, do ra, you, do, you do rapid oscillation between things. If you are thinking about golf while you're working, you're not going to work as well. If you are thinking about sex while you're golfing, you're not going to golf as well. And if, I know this is hard to imagine, you are thinking about work while you're having sex, sex is not going to be worth having. You can only do one thing at a time, and everything you decide to do is passing up an opportunity to do something else. Every decision we make entails missed opportunities. The only question is how many missed opportunities. With large choice sets, there are many missed opportunities. With smaller choice sets, there are not as many. I know, I knew, I know you don't believe that what I just said is true. I won't talk about this. So uh, I teach at a very wonderful uh, uh, college in uh, Pennsylvania. It's small, 1,400 students, some of the very best high school students in the United States. And throughout the world come, uh, these are people who could be going to places you've probably heard of, like Harvard and Princeton and Yale and Stanford, but they'd rather come to a small place. Um, and, uh, and what we are really good at is we, we encourage them to cultivate every talent and explore every, every interest. We are there to find a way to say yes, no matter what the students want to do. And they take advantage, mostly they take advantage of the extraordinary opportunities that we give them. But then, you know, they get to be, they get to their last year of college. And what they know is that this wonderland that they've been living in is about to come to an end. And they're going to have to make a decision about walking through one door and hearing all the other doors slam shut. Now, I gather in uh, places other than the United States, people face this at the end of high school, since you have to specialize much younger. Uh, uh, the United States tolerates useless uh, young adults far longer than the rest of the world does. <laughs> um, so, so here's the thing. They know, they know that this is the moment when life stops being a game and they have to get serious about one thing and they then have to figure out what one thing to get serious about. And here's what has been happening in recent years. Even in a down economy when people are not taking it for granted that they're going to get great jobs, that's, that's not what my students are worrying about. What they're worrying about is that they're going to make, walk through the wrong door. And so what they do is they postpone the decision. Some people know exactly what they want. I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a, a software developer, but many, many of the students I teach don't know exactly what they want to do. There's a family of things they're interested in. They can't figure out which door to walk through, so what they do is they defer it by, they go work waiting tables in a restaurant or working at Starbucks. Starbucks has the best educated workforce in the United States. It is full of people who are A students in college who can't figure out what the hell they're supposed to do next. Um, and they figure as time passes, one morning I'll wake up with, a, with a, a vision of what my life is supposed to be. But that doesn't happen. So day after day and week after week, they go to Starbucks and they make espresso and their parents are wondering why they spent $200,000 educating their children so that their children could have flourishing careers working at Starbucks. 
Without the $200,000, they could have had flourishing careers working at McDonald's. So I guess this is an upgrade. Um, and what, we see, uh, what I have learned the hard way is that there are questions you don't ask. I don't ask graduating seniors anymore. I don't ask them, so what are you going to do when you graduate? And the reason I don't is that if they know the answer to that question, they've almost certainly already told me. And if they don't know the answer to that question, this is the last thing on earth they want to discuss. And this is devastating, I think, to college students. And it is especially devastating to college students, of the, the, the more privileged college students, going to the best institutions. Because they're the one, we're the ones that basically tell them you can do all the different things you want to do. Whereas at other places, they're forced into to walk through a door much earlier, and they've kind of gotten used to it. Uh, many years ago, a very distinguished poet named Sylvia Plath, who committed suicide at a young age, wrote a book called The Bell Jar, an autobiographical memoir. And uh, there's a quote from her. She was a multi-talented young woman. And here's what she said. From the tip of every branch, like a fat purple fig, I guess I can read it down here, uh, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children. Another was a famous poet. Another was a brilliant professor. Another was Europe and Africa and South America. Another was an Olympic lady crew champion. And beyond and above these figs were many more figs I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of this fig tree starving to death just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. Now, this may seem overly dramatic, but in fact, at least in the U.S., psychological service provision at colleges and universities can't meet student demand. We keep adding staff, and the student demand for psychological services exceeds the staff, no matter how many staff we add. And I think a significant reason for this, not the only one, a significant reason for this is that we have educated these students so well that they think I can do anything, but I can't do everything, and they have no idea how to decide which thing of the many things they can do is the thing to devote their lives to. So I don't think this is just a minor annoyance. I think this is really quite consequential. There's another thing that having too many options does. It raises your expectations. Why? Well, let me tell you a true story. I wear jeans all the time. I thought it would be rude to wear them tonight, so I didn't. I'm feeling very disoriented. Um, and I buy my jeans at a, at a chain called The Gap. Do they have The Gap in... Uh, no, you're not missing much. And, you know, so, so I would wear jeans because I hate buying new jeans. I would wear them until they were disintegrating, falling apart. My wife would say, you cannot be seen in public wearing those things. So I would go and buy new ones. And I'd go into the Gap and I'd tell them I want a pair of jeans. I told them my size. And it would take 30 seconds. I'd have my jeans out. I would go. And that would be that for another two and a half years. But this time I walked into the Gap. And I told them my size, and the clerk said, do you want slim fit, easy fit, relaxed fit, boot cut, um, tapered, uh, stone washed, acid washed, dark, light? And I went, wait a second. I want the kind that used to be the only kind. There were two problems with my request. One. The clerk who was selling me jeans was about 12 years old and ha <laughs> had no idea what that was. And two, as I'm sure you can guess, they didn't make that kind anymore. So I tried them all on. I tried on every damn kind of jean they made. And I walked out with the best fitting pair of jeans I had ever owned. In case you haven't noticed, I don't exactly have a model's body. So expecting to walk out with a pair of jeans that fits really well is really completely unrealistic. But these jeans fit better than any jeans I'd ever had. I did better than I ever had before, and I felt worse. True, this really happened, and I really did feel worse. And the question is, why did I feel worse? And here's the answer. When jeans came in one or two styles, 
What kind of expectations did you have about how well they would fit? Are jeans going to fit you perfectly if there are one or two styles? Well, not unless you have a rare body, the kind that you see in magazines but you never actually see in real life. So they're going to fit, eh, and you're going to live with them or you're not going to buy jeans. So your expectations are low. If jeans come in 2,000 styles, what happens to your expectations? Surely one of those will be perfect. You, only a fool expects perfection when there are two options. It's reasonable to expect perfection when there are 2,000 options. So what happened to me at the Gap is that all these different varieties raised my expectations to the ceiling. And although I did better, I didn't do as well as I expected to do. And the result was that I felt like I had done worse. We often evaluate the outcomes of decisions by comparing them to what we expect those outcomes to be. Large choice sets inevitably raise our expectations, and that's an invitation for us to be disappointed with the results, even when the results are good. This captures what I just told you much more, much more quickly. Everything was better back when everything was worse. What does this mean? I don't want to romanticize poverty, but when living conditions were worse, expectations were modest. And when expectations are modest, it is possible to have experiences that exceed expectations. In the modern world, I think, expectations are so high, the best you can ever hope to do is have experiences that meet expectations. It's not possible to have experiences that exceed expectations because expectations are so high. Mostly, you're going to have experiences that fall short of expectations, and then you'll feel like you've made a bad decision. Okay, there's a wrinkle to this that I want to mention because it's my wrinkle. The choice problem is not so bad if all you are looking for is a good enough result. I want a good enough dinner. Not the best dinner at this restaurant. Not the best restaurant in the city. A good enough dinner. I want a good enough pair of jeans. I want a good enough lecture to go to, a good enough job, and perish the th I'm afraid to say this, a good enough romantic partner. Now, if you are looking for good enough, we call people who look for good enough satisficers, then you don't have to look at every option. You look at the options, and as soon as you encounter one that meets your standards, you choose it. It's good enough. End of story. So if there are two options, 10 options, 50 options, 200 options, how many options you look at is basically uh, the luck of what you're looking at first. Eventually, you'll find something that meets your standards, and then it doesn't matter what the other thousands of options are. The alternative, which is what we are all encouraged to pursue, is to find the best. Only the best will do. Maximized. The best restaurant, the best dish, the best jeans, the best job, the best romantic partner. Now, if you are out to find the best, how many of those 275 cereals do you have to examine before you know you've got the best? Every damn one. Exactly. So if you have the orientation that only the best will do, and the, the set of options is large, now you are, uh, 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 you're, it's a, this is a recipe for, misery, for failure and misery. It doesn't matter to have very high standards when there are only a few options. You're going to look at all of them anyway. But it really matters to have very high standards when there are lots and lots of options because then the only way to meet those standards is to do an exhaustive and exhausting search. So are, do people differ with respect to this? Are some people more inclined to say, take good enough and some people want the best? We developed a little scale and sure enough, people differ. Uh, oh, here's an example of a maximizer. This may not mean much to you. I apologize. Brown and Yale are two extraordinary uh, Ivy League, very hard to get into, very prestigious, very expensive institutions in the Northeast United States. Anybody who gets into either one of them should spend the next four years flying in the clouds in uh, ecstasy, kissing the ground, saying thank you to every person he sees, and instead, what happens is people who think they should be at Yale but end up having to suffer at Brown spend four years walking around thinking, oh, this is okay, but if only I were at Yale, life would be perfect. 
My own view is that people walk around at Brown with that attitude should just be thrown the hell out of Brown. But a lot of people have that attitude because they think only the best will do, especially when it comes to something as important as where you get your uh, university education. Here's a satisficer. <sighs> this, one didn't this one doesn't require explanation. This is the way to lower the divorce rate. Change the wedding vow. Uh, <laughs> That ain't happening. So anyway, we develop the scale. Some people score high as maximizers. Some score lower. And does it matter? Well, we gave people other scales. And it turns out that ma being a maximizer correlates with other things that matter. It correlates negatively with happiness, optimism, satisfaction with life, and self-esteem. What does that mean? The more of a maximizer you are, the less happy you are, the less optimistic you are, the less satisfied you are with your life, and the less you think of yourself. Not good. It correlates positively with regret, perfectionism, and depression. High maximizers are borderline clinically depressed on paper and pencil measures of depression. So again, this is not feeling mildly annoyed that you ordered the wrong dish at the restaurant. This produces real suffering, at least in some people. We also studied college seniors looking for jobs. We started working with them in October of their senior year, and we stayed with them until June when they graduated, and we tracked them through the whole process of looking for jobs. We gave them this scale that measures maximizing, we were interested in how hard their decision was, how many options they wanted, how well they did, and how they felt about how well they did. And here's what we found. If you were a maximizer, you considered more jobs, you wanted more options, you uh, spent a lot more time comparing how you were doing to how your friends were doing, and the good news is you got a better job. The starting salaries of maximizers were 20% higher than the starting salaries of satisficers, a significant effect. The study ended when they got their jobs. We don't know that they actually liked their jobs. The only thing we measured about the quality of the job was its starting salary. They did better. And you know there has to be an end. They were also more pessimistic, anxious, stressed, worried, tired, overwhelmed, depressed, regretful, and disappointed though they were less content, optimistic, elated, excited, and happy. With what? With the job they got, with the job search process they went through, and with their lives in general. They did better and they felt worse. And I think this actually tells us a, a, a something that's quite profound. If maximizing will produce better objective results than satisfying and it will produce worse subjective results. You will consistently do better if you have extraordinarily high standards and feel worse. And the question is, what's more important? How well you do or how you feel about how well you do? And I, this was a hard thing for me to uh, come, to, come, come to accept, I think there are virtually no decisions in life where the subjective doesn't turn out to be more important than the objective unless you, you, know, you make a completely ridiculously bad decision. But when you're operating in the domain of reasonably good decisions, it's almost certainly more important to feel good about the decision you've made than to make the best decision and feel bad about it. And if that's true, then having these abs absurdly high standards really is a recipe for a life of prolonged and, and repeated disappointment and dissatisfaction with every decision you make. It's very hard to get yourselves used to the idea that good enough is what you should be looking for and not the best. And the younger you are, the harder it is to accept that you want a good enough standard rather than the best standard. But I believe that's what the research shows. Okay. You remember way back in the last century, I acknowledged that choice is good. And then I talked about how it's bad. How can choice be good and bad? Here's how, I believe. I think that the things that make choice good and the things that make choice bad are very different things. So this captures how what's good about choice changes as the number of choices we have increases. 
This is, I want to make clear, this is a conceptual graph. These are not actual data. Just, just so you know, this isn't physics here. You don't get actual data like that in psychology. So, so all the way at the left, when people have no choice, life is infinitely bad. Human beings are not meant to live in a world where they have no autonomy and no control. As you give people choice, you make life better and better and better. But you'll notice this is not a straight line, it's a curve. It is a curve that students of economics are familiar with. It's the curve depicting diminishing marginal utility. The additional benefit of each new option gets smaller and smaller and smaller until the curve basically flattens out. Nonetheless, this clearly reflects that choice is good. So far, so good? The stuff I've been talking about looks like that. When there are not too many options, the paralysis, the regret, the um, missed opportunities, the raised expectations don't have much of an impact. As the number of options increases, the negatives increase, but they don't, get the, but they don't asymptote. Instead, they escalate. What's bad about too much choice gets more and more bad as the number of choices increases. That's what this curve captures. Notice these are independent effects. What's good is good. What's bad is bad. We've always known about what's good. We were only recently discovered what's bad. So the question is, how do you know how it feels to have a certain amount of choice? And the answer is you simply add those two curves together. The algebraic sum of those two curves gives you a curve that looks like this. This is a curve that Aristotle would love. When you have too little choice, life sucks. When you start to give people choice, life gets better. When you give them more and more choice, the curve changes direction. The bad starts to dominate the good. That's why the curve changes direction. So this is a curve that technically is what's called non-monotonic. It doesn't go in one direction. And if the bad is bad enough, not only does it move you back to neutral, it moves you below neutral to a, peer, to a state of considerable suffering. So I think this is how it's possible to understand why and how choice can simultaneously be good and bad. And the critical question is how much choice gets you to what you might call the sweet spot? How much choice does it take to get you to the place on the curve that's as far north of neutral as you can possibly get. We don't know the answer to that. There have been a few studies. I don't know what happened to this slide. There's another word on it. There have been a few studies of um, uh, trying to find the sweet spot that have suggested that the optimum number of options is around 8, 10, or 12. You give people more options than that, and they start choosing none of the above. You give people fewer options than that, and they don't find anything that they like. So as a rule of thumb, if you're creating a new product, I would create eight or 10 variants on that product. Um, but there's, it's foolish to assume that the, the right sweet spot is going to be the same no matter what domain of decision making you're talking about. We don't know. The only way to find out, I believe, is by doing the research. It's extremely unlikely that there is a one-size-fits-all answer to this question. If you care about it, study it and look for the sweet spot when it comes to buying a car or buying a bike or renting an apartment or what have you. Okay, so what to do about too much? There's another word that was somehow deleted from this slide. Anyone want to guess what that other word is? I'll give you a hint. It starts with a C. Ah, Here's what to do about too much choice. And this brings up the ethical dimensions of the choice overload problem. Uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler wrote a book called Nudge. They wrote a paper prior to the book called Libertarian. Well, you don't need to know what the paper is called. But here's, here was their point. Here was their point. In the United States, or here's an example of their point. In the United States, if you do a poll uh, to see what percentage of the population approves of organ donation, you discover that around 97% of Americans approve of organ donation. In the United States, you get to be an organ donor when you renew or take, get your driver's license, and there's a little form with a box. You check the box, you sign the form, and now you're an organ donor. And if you get killed in a car accident, they will harvest you instead of burying you. That's how we do it. 
And 90, as I say, 97% of Americans approve of organ donation. So what percentage of Americans do you imagine are organ donors? Five? God, you really, you, might, you have a low opinion of us, don't you? No. 27%. Now, I know the reason why. The reason why is that it's hard. You, here's, think of what you have to do. There's this box right on the form. You've got to take a pen and do that. And then you've got to take the pen and sign your name. Who's got time for that when there are 275 serials to choose between? <laughs> it's an essentially zero demanding thing. And nonetheless, only a third of people, only a quarter of people who approve of organ donation are organ donors. So this is a problem. We don't have enough organs. This is a plot of the free likelihood of or the frequency of organ donor donors by country in Europe. Denmark, Netherlands, UK, and this is old. This is a decade old. They're kind of where the United States is. All these gold countries, mean-spirited, selfish, self-absorbed, nasty people. All the blue countries, Austria, Belgium, France, Hungary, Poland, Portugal and Spain, everybody's willing, you know, just cut me open, take my organs. So what's the difference between the blue countries and the gold countries? Nice people and nasty people? You know that that's not the difference. What do you think is the difference? Obligated. Obligated. They're not obligated. Not obligated. In the blue countries, you are an organ donor unless you choose not to be. In the gold countries, you are not an organ donor unless you choose to be. So the difference is what happens when people do nothing. We are not going to legislate how many kinds of cereal you sell. We are just stuck with people, excuse me, paralyzed into indecision. That's life. No one's going to pass a law that says supermarkets can only carry six kinds of cereal. So if people are going to be paralyzed into doing nothing, set up the environment so that when they do nothing, they get what they want. And we know from polling that people want to be organ donors. They tell us. So set it up so that default, when people don't act, gets them what they want. And the blue countries have done that, and the gold countries have not done that. And as you can see, there's a tripling of organ donation based on something that is essentially free. This is a, pu a, a public policy that costs nothing to implement. All you have to do is change the form, and you triple organ donation. 401k, retirement participation. The standard procedure in the U.S. is that your employer cannot withhold any of your salary unless you give your employer permission. You sign a form that says, take 5% of my paycheck and put it into a mutual fund. What happens if you reverse that so that your employer will withhold 5% of your salary unless you tell them not to? All you're doing is changing the default. Same exact thing as organ donation. Yes, you with me? Triple the rate of 401k participation simply by changing the default. So given that people are going to be paralyzed, you can try to structure what Sunstein and Thaler call the choice architecture so that paralysis leads to good outcomes rather than bad outcomes. And the reason they call it libertarian paternalism is that it's paternalistic in the sense that you are really engineering the choice environment to try to increase the chances of a particular result. But the reason it's libertarian is you are not compelling. It is easy enough to opt out. If you have the feeling that you don't want to be an organ donor or you want to spend all of your money, it's easy enough to opt out. It's just easier not to. And I think this is a significant thing that can be done in the face of this uh, 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 unavoidable paralysis that people have when it comes to making decisions. Almost done. Yeah, last point. Choice and happiness. We all want to be happy. Yes, everybody here want to be happy? You people live in one of the happiest countries on the planet. Even though, you know, the weather sucks, <laughs> you seem really to be happy people. I don't know any of you personally, but since you live here, you must be happy since everyone else who lives here is happy. The country Grandpa came from was a stinking hell of unspeakable poverty where everyone was always happy. Now, here's what's false about this. In stinking hell holes of unspeakable poverty, people are not happy. Here's what's true about this. It is remarkable 
how happy people were and are under conditions that barely exceed subsistence. One of the things that people who live in, quote, stinking hell holes of unspeakable poverty have is they have constraints on what's possible. Yes, they have some choice, but their choice options are severely limited by the material circumstances of their lives. And that might actually end up liberating them rather than feel, inducing them to feel deprived. What really makes people happy, we now know, are a couple of things. This, the single most important determinant of happiness is how good your network of close relations is, your network of friends, family, community. The stronger that network, the more connected you feel to other people, the happier you are. Other things like money and even work and um, um, physical health pale in comparison to feeling like you belong to people who care about you. But here's the, here's the funny thing about close relations to other people. You may not have thought about this, but when you have a network of close relations to other people, it limits your choice. It constrains you. You can't go to Australia to take a job if it means leaving behind all of these people who will be made miserable by your absence. All of a sudden, the set of possible jobs is dramatically reduced to the set of jobs that will allow you to maintain your connections to these people that you mean a lot to and who mean a lot to you. Close relations mean reduction in your freedom of choice. You have to worry about the effects of your actions on other people. That constrains your choices. Now, what I used to think, until I started thinking about choice more generally, is that it tells you how powerful uh, how powerfully good close relations are that people are willing to suffer reduced freedom in return for which they get close relations. What I now think is that, is that the constraint, the limit, of in limit on choice has become part of the benefit. In the world we live in, people are desperately looking for ways to limit their options, though they may not say it. And being constrained by your, your friends and your family limits your options. And th in this world, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Forty years ago, it was a bad thing. In other cultures now, that's a bad thing. People don't have enough choice. In modern, uh, affluent, dem democratic societies like ours, limiting options has become a good thing. And social relations help to limit options. You can be anything you want to be, no limits. So when I first saw this cartoon, I thought, huh, the cartoonist is trying to point out how amazingly uh, short-sighted myopic a f that fish is, that parent is, right? Here's a fishbowl. You can be anything you want. What can you be inside that fishbowl? There is nothing going on. We educated liberal, uh, uh, democratic citizens of the modern world know how impoverished it is to live in a fishbowl like that. So we're making fun of that fish for being so damn stupid. And what I started to think is what, I don't know what the cartoonist meant, but what the cartoon started to mean to me is everybody needs a fishbowl. Everyone needs constraints. We know enough about human beings to know that the fishbowl needs to have more than one little toy castle in it. It needs to be a reasonably rich fishbowl, but everybody needs constraints. Fishbowl provides constraints. When you shatter the fishbowl, most of the things that ha thereby liberating the fish, almost everything that will happen to that fish is bad. You'll get stepped on, you'll get eaten by the family cat, You'll, you'll suffer from, uh, you know, you won't get enough oxygen and you'll just die. I mean, what good can come of having a fishbowl shattered? It's one, there's a catastrophe after another. So we need fishbowls and what social scientists need to do, maybe with help from philosophers, is figure out what needs to be in the human fishbowl so that the benefits of freedom that we know exist can be realized and the costs of freedom that I've been trying to discuss with you tonight can be prevented. What does the human fishbowl need to be like? Thank you very much. Thank you.